Good morning, everyone. Welcome to WorkCover Queensland's common law webinar titled What Employers Can Do to Avoid Workplace Injuries and Common Law Claims. My name is Hannah Staunton and I'll be your host for today. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to Queensland's elders past, present and emerging. We thank the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia for their ongoing custodianship of land, waters and community. Our webinar today will follow a different format to our previous webinars for this year. Today's webinar will take the format of a moderated panel discussion with our two guest speakers. We won't be relying heavily on PowerPoint slides today. Instead, we ask our listeners to sit back and concentrate on the learnings and messages being shared by our guest speakers. Treat it kind of like an interactive podcast. We are aiming to finish our webinar at around 10.50 a.m. today to allow those wishing to observe Remembrance Day at 11 a.m. sufficient time to get organised. If you need to leave a bit earlier, this session will be recorded and we will send a link to the recording out via email by early next week. It will also be uploaded to WorkCover Queensland's YouTube channel. Please feel free to submit any questions during the webinar using the panel on the right hand side of your screen. We will aim to ask your questions of our guest speakers if time permits and if the questions are relevant for all listeners involved. I'd like to introduce our guest speakers for today's webinar. I'd like to give a warm welcome to Luke Murphy, partner of Murphy Schmidt Solicitors. Luke has over 30 years of experience practicing across several areas of law, in particular personal injuries law and succession in the state law. Luke is the immediate past president of the Queensland Law Society and is the deputy chair of the Accident Compensation Tort Law Committee. Welcome, Luke. And secondly, I'd like to welcome Terry Killian, partner of Hall & Wilcox. As, may, as you all know, Hall & Wilcox is one of WorkCover's panel law firms who manage WorkCover's common law claims for damages. Terry has over 25 years insurance litigation experience with his past 20 years focused predominantly on advising underwriters and self-insurers in the defence of damages claims for personal injuries, property damage and financial loss. Welcome, gentlemen. I'd also like to remind our listeners that any advice given or questions answered today by Paul and Wilcox and Murphy Schmidt is general information only and should not be taken as legal advice. Okay, so as you can tell from our title of our webinar, we have Luke and Terry here today to discuss avoiding workplace injuries and common law claims. Naturally, it makes sense to split this topic into two discussion points. Firstly, how to avoid injuries from happening in the workplace. And secondly, when an injury does occur in the workplace, how things can be managed to either avoid the common law claim or to minimise the impact of the claim. We have strategically invited both Luke and Terry here today so we can look at the topics from both the perspective of a plaintiff lawyer and a defendant lawyer. Now, Luke and Terry, I'm going to hand the reins over to you um, to have a conversation first, starting on our first topic. How to avoid injuries from happening in the workplace. Terry, I understand you're going to start the discussions. Thanks, Hannah, and good morning, everyone. Um, at the outset, I wanted to just say that we'd like our discussion this morning to be more in the nature of just an interactive conversation. And I think rather than get bogged down in sort of the legal technicalities of avoiding injuries and the legal technicalities of common law claims, to rather focus on some practical examples of what both Luke and I have seen across the course of our careers in areas that tend to come to the forefront um, from both injury pre prevention perspective and then also what causes injuries that have occurred to ultimately result in common law claims. Um, obviously, and, and as per Hannah's introduction, the perspective I bring to that is that of the employer. Um, and so I tend to look at it either from the perspective of insurers, of employers like WorkCover, or self-insurers in that scheme. Um, there is, as most of the listeners would be aware, an enormous volume of material in terms of employers' workplace health and safety obligations, 
risk assessments, training, supervision, etc. Um, and there are resources available both on the WorkCover website and from many sources that assist employers in the development of policies, procedures and ways of going about doing their business. Um, and certainly the discussion this morning isn't intended to replace any of that material and is certainly not intended to, um, to take the place of very specific initiatives that are in place in very specific industries and ways in which tasks or particular activities are undertaken. Um, a few initial observations that I have in this space just before passing over to Luke on that topic is that the approach to workplace health and safety varies markedly from business to business. And we see businesses across probably the entire spectrum um, of the Queensland market. So everything from multinational corporations with very sophisticated structures and enormous workforces through to mum and dad businesses um, where there is a much more direct and personal relationship between the individuals running the business and those um, who are employed in that business. And I think the first thing that I notice is you can't necessarily um, just draw a conclusion that because an employer is large, it will be sophisticated in its response to um, occupational health and safety risk. And equally, you can't draw the conclusion that a small business won't be sophisticated. The way in which they go about doing things really does vary from individual business to individual business. Um, the opportunities perhaps to be quite sophisticated in that role are more prevalent in a larger business, but I've certainly seen examples at, at both ends of that spectrum and we'll talk about that. Probably the biggest observation that I would make is that those businesses that I see do it really successfully view it as an integral part of the way in which they do business. That is, view occupational health and safety as an integral part. They don't view it as a compliance requirement or, or something that they do almost as an afterthought or something that they do to avoid workplace health and safety consequences. It's just how they go about doing business each and every day. Um, the second thing I would say is there is a clear expectation these days around risk management and around systems of work, et cetera, that leads to the generation of a significant volume of documentary material, whether that be physical documentary material or increasingly electronically maintained material, manuals, procedures, job safety analysis, um, all of that sort of documentation. Um, and lawyers are people who probably historically love paper. So one of the first things we tend to go to when confronted with um, a challenge around an occupational health and safety event is, well, what, what do the documents say? What do the documents suggest? Um, what I would say is the documents are helpful to a point, but they don't really replace or um, overcome an inherent deficiency in the way things actually get done in a particular workplace. So you can have and have paid for in many occasions the best set of procedures or manuals in the world, but if they don't reflect what actually occurs on a day-to-day -day basis on the factory floor, in that retail store, in that mine, if they don't actually reflect what truly happens, um, then they don't alter the outcome and they don't provide the sort of protection that, that is spoken about. Um, they're helpful, but fundamentally it comes back to understanding at a business level, what is it that our people actually do? What is it that we expect of them? Have we trained them in how to do those tasks? Have we updated that training? Have we conducted refresher training? Is it something that's front of mind? And as I alluded to earlier, does it reflect how we actually do things on a day-to-day -day basis? 
So it's probably enough from me as an introduction. Um, there's a few more specific examples that I can get into, but I think it might be an opportune time for Luke to, to offer some preliminary observations. Thanks very much, Terry. And Hannah, thank you very much for uh, uh, allowing me to participate. And good morning, everyone. Um, can I just endorse uh, at the start exactly uh, what Terry has just said, um, and I won't uh, I won't repeat the the comments uh, that Terry's made. But uh, from a plaintiff perspective, the relevance of policy and the relevance of the practical application um, is at the very forefront of what we see as being contributing factors to injuries. Um, Terry made the point that the, it, what he sees uh, or has seen over his 20 plus years is that where occupational health and safety is viewed as an integral part and not seen as a compliance obligation, you have a much more beneficial outcome from the adoption of policies, the implementation of policies. And that is something that as a plaintiff lawyer uh, becomes very, very significant in assessing why an injury may have been sustained. The, it is very rare now because of the prevalence of policies and manuals and the availability of so much material and indeed the development of sophisticated models and protocols, uh, it's extremely rare that you come across a workplace that does not have some policy there which they can refer to. From a plaintiff lawyer's point of view, if there is an absence of policy, then that's an absolute glare in omission. Um, given how sophisticated and common the uh, policies are. But what's becoming more of an issue is the point that Terry made about the practical application and adoption of the policies. And that's something I think that Terry would agree and uh, with can be described as a culture or a reflection of the culture of the workplace. And whilst the, doc, the existence of documents are helpful, and as Terry said, lawyers love documents, it's not that the, the existence of the documents that are relevant. More and more, it is how often they are implemented, refreshed, and then brought to the attention of the employees. And it is not enough now to simply have it as an induction process and then leave it for uh, years before it's refreshed. If there is a culture of occupational health and safety being part and parcel of day-to-day -day work, you find that it is in fact a regular occurrence for people to be reminded of safe lifting techniques, of the use of protective equipment. Um, what we find is, or what we look for as plaintiff lawyers, are uh, specifically when you have a particular injury, what is the, um, what are the recommended safety policy and risk assessment? How has that been implemented? And it is not uncommon for us to find that the actual risk has been identified, but then as a result of some changes in the workplace, it has not been followed up. And by way of uh, example of that, one of my uh, current claims revolves around a safety procedure in dealing with patients in a hospital. And the need for the procedure was correctly identified, but the difficulty was there was then a decision made as to who would undergo the training in that procedure. Again, a sensible decision made, but 
the wards which the policy applied to and which staff were trained in were then shut and the patients were distributed to other wards where the staff weren't trained. And the claim that we have arises as a result of staff being asked to um, undertake a particular task which they weren't trained in, although there was a policy there, but not applied because of the change that was a, it was a necessary economic and administrative change. But in making that, there was an oversight in who was trained in that particular policy. And that's a, uh, from a plaintiff lawyer's point of view, a very simple example of where, for very understandable reasons, there has been an oversight in the adoption of, or the enforcement of the policy at a practical level, and it has led to uh, what could have been, otherwise could have, should have been an, uh, an avoidable injury. Terry, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Um, probably just to move some observations into those areas where I, across a cross section, and there's necessarily generalities in this, but the areas where I see employers manage risk well across the board and the areas where we perhaps see that risk isn't managed so well. And the general observation I would make is that I think through the development of the OCH health and safety laws and the approach to safety, et cetera, that employers are generally very good at managing risks that fall into that sort of high risk, high consequence action. So for example, the risk of explosion in a mine site, um, the risk of falls from heights, the the sort of risks where the immediate aftermath of that risk materialising can be catastrophic. And I think employers generally, and there are certainly exceptions that can be pointed to, but employers generally are very good at managing those risks, at putting in place procedures, and at really reinforcing and enforcing those procedures. Um, so generally, I think those risks get managed well. If you look at the sort of entire portfolio of common law claims that um, an organisation like WorkCover Queensland faces, the majority of those common law claims don't have their, their genesis in those sort of high risk, high consequence events. The majority of those have their origins in what I would describe as routine tasks that the employers, that the employees perform each and every day. And on one particular occasion, something happens in the way they're performing an activity that they've often performed hundreds of times before. And um, anecdotally, I don't have detailed statistics sitting in front of me, but anecdotally, variations of manual handling claims still predominate in terms of what turns into to common law claims. And the thing about manual handling claims, I think, that, that can sometimes cause, complacency is probably overstating it, but can sometimes cause there not to be as great a focus as there might be on those sort of um, more immediately obvious high risk, is that the sorts of injuries that tend to result from a manual handling claim, probably the most common being a back injury, um, aren't as immediately obvious as being a high consequence event. Someone might sustain, for example, a back injury in a manual handling scenario in a workplace, and in the immediate aftermath of that incident, it's not actually apparent that there will be long-term consequences um, and significant consequences of that event in the same way that it's obviously immediately apparent if someone falls from a height that there has been serious injury, et cetera. And probably because people sustain those types of injuries on a daily basis and the majority of them probably don't end up having a long-term consequence but a significant enough proportion of them do end up having a long-term um, consequence. And 
they're the ones that, particularly if you've got workers who are in manual or predominantly manual occupations, where they can have a significant impact on that individual's capacity to continue working um, or to continue working in the type of work that they were doing. And because in a common law context, when we get to that, we're looking at a once and for all payment that is designed to, to compensate an injured worker for their lifetime, the consequences of a restriction or an inability to work are significant. Apart from catastrophic injuries, that component is the most significant component of most common law damages awards. And so even though in the immediate aftermath of the incident, it may not have appeared that serious, its consequences are serious. And I think because of that, and I, I do stress it is a generality, but I see it across enough claims to, to say that it forms a pattern, those types of risks aren't as well managed as perhaps they could be. And they're the ones where we can see the example, um, and Luke sort of touched on the idea of, well, there was manual handling training because in the induction that the particular employee underwent in 2013, they were taken through some slides in relation to um, safe manual handling. And then they worked in the employer's business for seven years without any additional training or instruction, doing manual handling tasks in a variety of ways and a variety of scenarios without any additional input um, or um, training, instruction, supervision, being told they weren't doing something um, in a particular way. And they're the examples of where the employer will struggle. It, it's got to be relevant and it's got to be timely and it's got to be reinforced, particularly where those duties are at the core of what someone does. And the other things that I probably see quite regularly in that space are injuries that are said to have resulted from time pressures, um, and that can often be contentious. I appreciate that, that it might be asserted that there were time pressures and that might be something which is disputed, but it's quite common to see allegations about, I was rushed, I needed to get X done, we needed to get this particular load out by this time, et cetera, so there was an element of time pressure. The second, and I think where it can get more contentious, is the argument that the employee themselves was meant to conduct a job safety analysis or meant to conduct their own assessment of a particular risk and that the reason the injury occurred was because they didn't do so. And why I say that's contentious is this. Um, courts have made it very clear that it's not a defence for an employer to say that an employee should have designed their own safe system of work, that that fundamental obligation falls on the employer. Now, that doesn't mean that the employer is obliged to prescribe a way of performing each and every task that an employee might be called upon to do in the course of their employment. Um, that would be an unrealistic expectation on an employee to, to have that level of prescription. There will always be different scenarios that employees are confronted with in the course of their employment um, that require the exercise of some judgment and require the employee to apply training and instruction that they have been given to a, a very specific set of circumstances. But that's different to generic sort of, say, manual handling training and then expecting an employee to devise systems of work that are just common activities that they perform. From my point of view, the test there really is, is the activity being performed something that is a regular and integral part of what the employee does day to day? If it is, there ought to be a way that it's done, a prescribed way that it's done, a procedure, however you want to describe it. If it is a more unique, 
scenario, but not something which is unique in the sense of it poses a really significant risk, which of itself requires a thing. It's just an application of those general principles. Then there is the opportunity for employers to appropriately rely upon those sorts of things like job safety analysis to say, well, you had a checklist, you had a checklist of things to look at when you were confronting the particular task you were about to undertake. You'd been trained in how to um, manage risk and then you just had to apply it to a very specific circumstance. And that's where there is opportunities for employers to avoid common law claims through the use of those. But it can't be a substitute for the employer's fundamental obligation, if I go right back to the start, that provide, maintain and enforce a safe system of work. That obligation falls squarely on the employer. I don't know if you had any thoughts or observations on that. Yeah, no, I might just take the opportunity to again uh, just reinforce what Terry said. And I think it does come back to that uh, culture of um, adopting and implementing a safe workplace. And Terry's uh, spot on the money from a plaintiff lawyer's point of view in terms of um, the routine tasks that give rise to claims. And this is where the culture becomes so important because the catastrophic claims, as Terry mentioned, always at the forefront, always highlighted and uh, and for natural and very sensible reasons. But it's those routine daily tasks that are often identified in the initial documents, manual handling, uh, use of protective equipment, but then in the day-to-day -day tasks, it does often drop and it's often not implemented. It's not uncommon for us to be sitting down with a client in the initial stages where we're taking a statement about what happened and particularly after we have been provided with the, uh, the policies that have been adopted and implemented and you're saying to the client, well, you know, there is a policy here that you must wear gloves, but you're telling us you didn't talk us through it and they'll say yes I signed that document yes gloves were provided but for the last five years I never wore them and no one ever took them to task and therefore it becomes an accepted practice that yes there's a policy yes there's a provision but it was never implemented. And it, it, it's often not implemented, I think, Terry, because of that reason you touched on, of it becomes such a daily routine, it, there's not accidents every day, and there is a need to ensure that the work is processed and that we actually get the job done. Um, and that's where that culture of enforcing the adopted policy and dealing with those employees that say, well, you know, I work better without having that protective equipment, you've got to be able to say to them, the policy is this, it's there for good reason, and, you know, you, you, you've got to adopt it. Um, and that is something that uh, we do see, as Terry mentioned, um, relatively regularly uh, with the, um, uh, with the, the claims. Would it be fair to say, um, you mentioned the difference between um, employer companies that have health and safety as an integral part of their business as opposed to those that don't. Those people that, um, those businesses where it's not as integral, they're basically just ticking a box, so to speak. And do you think it, um, in those group of companies, the whole onus and burden of ensuring the health and safety of your workers, like it must be scary for an employer. Like obviously they want to keep their workers safe, but sometimes the whole work health and safety arena is just too big a beast and they don't know where to start. Yeah, I'm happy to go first on that, Terry. Hannah, one of the comments I was going to make was it, it, it's a daunting field now. There is so much material. There is just so many different um, services available that recommend the uh, various policies and implementation programs. 
I can perfectly understand why occupational health and safety um, managers just feel completely overwhelmed with it. Um, Terry made the, the point in one of his earlier comments about making sure that it's a practical application. And that's really the crux, I think, of the um, entire approach that needs to be taken. Um, there isn't any perfect system, it just doesn't exist. But there's only so much that any human being can do in responding to particular risks, and it has to be practical risks. And the courts do take into account what is a reasonable response to that risk. There is not an absolute protection duty that is imposed if there have been reasonable steps taken and, uh, you know, a, um, notwithstanding those steps, an employee ignores the, the recommendations. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to touch on that point, that the courts are quite reasonable in, in what an employee is expected to do in response to a risk. It just should, the, from what I um, have read and understood, that the, the courts are quite reasonable. Um, and understand that sometimes injuries just do occur. Um, well, from a plaintiff lawyer's point of view, sometimes we feel that the courts are unreasonable in the position they, they take. And I perfectly understand that that view is shared by uh, employers and defendant lawyers um, in, in other cases. So um, the, the courts do, I think, do a pretty good job, uh, Terry, in assessing the, uh, the risk. There's always the outlier decisions, but it, it does come back to that um, practical assessment and a practical application that's well documented, well implemented, and then there's a culture within the organisation where it's important. It can't be the be all and end all at the cost of a viable business, because the whole reason people are there is to earn a, a wage. But at the same time, it has to be part and parcel of the uh, of the day-to-day -day, uh, operations. Yeah, exactly. Look, we might move on to the second topic because I feel like our, our discussion is there already. Um, obviously, um, sometimes the injuries do occur at the workplace. Um, so the next step, I guess, for employees is how to avoid the common law claim and or how to the, avoid the impact of a common law claim if one is bought by an injured worker. Um, Look, um, Luke, I, we might start with you, if you don't mind touching on um, the topic of, of why an injured worker um, comes to see a plaintiff solicitor, um, and we might take it from there, if that's all right. Uh, more than happy to, Hannah. Um, can I just say, contrary to popular belief um, and uh, common acceptance, the vast majority of clients I've acted for in the 32 years I've been in practice have not been motivated by the receipt of damages. The initial attendance is often that they feel they have been um, left alone, unsupported and dealt with harshly in the circumstances of the injuries. Um, if you'll indulge me for one further uh, war story, it's one that I've never ever been able to forget because the client was an employee of a, a large commercial operation uh, for some 31 years at the time that he had sustained his injury. And he had uh, uh, risen to a significant management level where at uh, various stages he had been working on building sites with 110 employees under him. So he was a trusted employee. He was obviously um, a well-respected employee who assumed responsibility. And he sustained horrendous injuries to both ankles in a fall on a construction site, which there were a number of contributing factors to. And when I came, when he came to see me, I said, "Mate, why are you here? You know, the uh, you're back at work with the uh, employer, um, and they have managed to uh, 
um, accommodate you? And he said, I don't care. He said, when I had the injury, I was in hospital for 14 days. My wife was on her own. No one from the employer not only contacted me, none of my co-workers contacted me, no one contacted my wife, no one contacted my family. And what he was left with was this feeling that he was just a number. He'd done 31 years of what he saw as loyal service. I don't know whether it was or not, but he had clearly held positions of responsibility. And it was simply that he hadn't been supported. And that was his motivation. And it's something I've never forgot for someone who had been with an employer for so long. And to the contrary of that, I am aware of a story out of um, a white goods manufacturing company in Adelaide where they had a significant um, sickness issue and they employed a new occupational health and safety manager who adopted a policy of whenever anyone, any employee rang in sick, he would phone them that day. He would ask them how they were, had they been to see a doctor, was there anything that they could do to help? And then if they didn't come in the next day, he would go around and visit them. Now, I know that not all employees will warmly embrace a visit at home um, after the uh, on a second day, but it was done on the basis of checking in, how are you going, what can we do to assist, is there anything that you need that you may not be able to have gone out and got for yourself. In the first 12 months of this gentleman's employment, he successfully halved the absence rate and halved the injury rate. And it's those two stories that have always stuck in my mind of being consistent with the cultural comments that Terry and I were making earlier about the workplace health and safety being relevant. And it's so relevant that we're concerned about you when you are ill or when you are um, uh, have suffered an injury. And it reinforces how important it is and how important the employee is. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, that's had a dramatic impact. And the failure to do that is often a significant motivation in employees coming to see solicitors in the first place. And of course, once we start the common law process, the only thing that we can uh, achieve for an employee through that common law process is some damages, and it comes down to hard uh, money that is adequate compensation for them. Look, I'm just gonna ask you a quick question, and I'm sure Terry has some um, views on this topic as well. Um, when an injured worker comes to see you and say that there's, they cannot return to work, um, there's some preconceived views and things out there. Are, are injured workers motivated to get back into the workforce? Um, the uh, One of the things that can, the best thing that any injured person can do for a common law claim, in my view, is they go back to work. Now that doesn't mean that they um, necessarily get back to full-time work, but going back to work in whatever capacity they can assists enormously in resolving a common law claim and resolving it early. Um, Hannah, you asked the question of when, they, when a, a, an employee comes and tells you that they can't return to work. The, the real answer to that question is it's not up to the employee, of course. It's a, it's a question of medical evidence, and it's not uncommon where you have medical evidence that says they can work and the employee saying, I can't. And that's a cause of angst, not only for someone defending it, it's also a cause of angst for a plaintiff lawyer. And that actually 
in my view, is a weak spot for any plaintiff claim where there is the possibility of a claimant being discredited as a result of the inconsistency between the, the medical prognosis and the um, instructions that have been received. Now, that can sometimes be explained, but it is, uh, once it's arisen, it's an area that needs to have work devoted to it. I understand. Terry, look, you deal with employers. A common law claim um, hits the books and, and you're appointed on behalf of WorkCover or a self-insurer um, to help manage a common law claim. Um, you obviously um, also manage the um, employer with that common law claim. When you speak to employers, um, what, how are they feeling when the common law claim hits the books and, and how do you try to help them manage that? I suppose that issue can, like a lot of them, vary a lot from employer to employer. And what I would describe that is almost how personally the claim is perceived. Um, and that can be impacted, as we were talking earlier, about different sizes of organisation and the connections between the people involved in the day-to-day -day work that that injured worker might perform and the people who might be involved in providing instructions or managing the workers' compensation claim into the common law claim from the employer's perspective. Um, in larger organisations, there's often a degree of separation between those people, and there might not be what I would call the, the personalisation of the fact of the claim. In a smaller business, it may well be one and the same person who is dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with the employee and is trying to provide instructions and manage the consequences of um, the claim. And understandably, that can present some challenges, particularly in that second scenario, because the thing about the common law scenario is it has attached to it this concept of fault. And so people's human reaction when they're told that they've been negligent, um, most individuals don't like to have it suggested to them that they have been negligent. I wouldn't like having that suggested to me oh, at a personal level. And so there's an understandable almost human reaction to that. And so an initial part of that conversation is just taking the employer through or the individual through the concept of legal liability and the standards that courts impose on employers and what all of that means in a, in a truly practical sense. And those standards are undoubtedly very high standards that, that are imposed on um, employers. And Luke's right, I mean, the courts have interpreted those standards in different incarnations and different variations of legislation over many years. But I think you could safely say that they're high standards that get imposed on, on employers. Um, there's an awareness, I think, of the existence of compulsory insurance, and I think that can influence um, the, the level of those standards on occasions. Um, if I go back to, to Luke's immediate observation, I'd endorse that idea that the first thing that I think triggers the angst and triggers the existence of the claim is how that individual worker perceived they were treated in the immediate aftermath of the incident. And often when a common law claim gets brought, we might be two or three years down the track from the incident, but they haven't forgotten what happened on day two, on day four, on day seven. So that, that sort of immediate response, and not just the legalistic response, not just did the employee jump in and employer jump in and investigate the incident and take witness statements and do all of those sort of um, legal obligations. How did they actually interact with and treat the injured employer in the immediate, injured employee in the immediate aftermath? Um, the second thing that I think has had a big influence by that point is whether or not the injured worker has been able to return to work. That, more than anything, I suspect, triggers decisions to bring common law claims. Ideally, they've been able to return to work in their pre-accident role, 
but if that's not feasible, they've been able to return to work in a meaningful role. Um, now, I should also say when we're talking about common law claims, statistically, they still represent a very small proportion of the overall claims in the Queensland scheme. The, the conversion rate of statutory workers' compensation claims into common law damages claims still th sits, I think, somewhere between three and four percent. So it's still a very small proportion of overall injuries that are compensable under Queensland legislation that end up as common law claims. Um, the, the areas that I think employers have the greatest challenges with are claims where there is some significant underlying factual dispute about what actually happened, where there are fundamentally different accounts about the way in which the incident occurred. I think those can be challenging for employers. I think claims where there has been a delay in the reporting of the injury, um, sometimes delays of months, bring with them, I think, um, a degree of scepticism that might have its origins right back in the statutory claim being accepted 18 months ago. And I think they're challenging claims for employers and I understand why that's so. And increasingly, I think, and, and increasingly across the scheme, probably both at a, a statutory level and at a common law level, is claims involving pure psychiatric injury. I think they are incredibly challenging claims, probably both for plaintiffs and plaintiff lawyers, and certainly they are challenging claims from an employer perspective. Exactly, there's so many emotions involved for all parties. Um, I'm being conscious of time. Luke, um, and then I'll ask you as well, Terry, if you had to give employers your top tips or pieces of advice of um, how to avoid or manage the impact of a common law claim for the injured worker, what would they be? Uh, it's simple in my view, Hannah, um, it's to keep talking to them. And um, just don't bring down the shutters. Uh, uh, you know, there's a number of, of stories that I, I could tell where that's worked positively for both the employee and the employer, where there's been an ongoing engagement. Um, just keep talking to people and letting them know that there's a genuine concern um, and that makes the world a difference. It, it makes the world a difference to the ultimate common law claim as well. It doesn't necessarily mean there won't be a claim, but it means there's this openness and frankness of discussion, which assists enormously in getting a reasonable resolution. Um, yeah, no doubt about that in my view. It's important for employers to show the human side, right? And as Terry pointed on, pointed out that the, the time frames between when an injury does occur and a stat claim um, and the common law claim can be three plus years. Very much so. So, so that's a, a long time for a relationship to be negative. So yep. yeah. No, I agree completely. It's uh, and the longer that negative uh, negativity continues, the the harder it is to resurrect a meaningful and beneficial relationship for both employer and employee, and then that bitterness just becomes ingrained. Yeah. Um, quick question that's just come up. I know we're on a time limit here. What are your views on employers um, offering an apology or an expression of regret? Do you think they have? It has any merit or, or worth? Personally, I, I uh, think that it's um, an apology without accepting liability is worth its weight in gold. Now, there's um, there's fear within the black letter uh, law application that it will be interpreted as uh, an admission, um, and I think that you know if you were to say, look, I'm very sorry that you you know you have sustained this injury. Um, or I'm disappointed that you've sustained this injury, what can we do to help? That's that's sending that supportive message. Um, and I don't, I mean, Terry can, uh, I can uh, be interested in Terry's view in that, but I don't, I wouldn't see that as being a, uh, 
uh, an admission of guilt. And I certainly wouldn't be saying to any client that uh, that can be relied on to ensure you have a, a common law claim. No, that's good advice. And Terry, your your um, views and top tips and advice for um, employers, are they along the same lines? Or? Yeah, certainly that maintaining of relationship, I think right from the outset is, is the number one advice and keeping those communication lines open. I think one thing we often say to employers is where, where they have an ongoing employment relationship is you need to manage that relationship independently of the common law claim. That is, I think employers can get themselves into trouble if they start thinking, if we do this in the employment relationship, it'll have this consequence for the common law claim. Manage that worker as though they didn't have a common law claim and in the way that you would normally manage a worker in that scenario. It's almost the opposite of that, that example Luke was giving about um, people being sort of told not to return to work. Um, I'd like to think that doesn't happen too often these days. There are examples of that um, and, and judges have had to consider that of recent times, but it's uncommon for workers to actually be told not to go back to work. Most workers are undoubtedly better off in secure ongoing employment. It's getting a slightly smaller common law damages payout but from a financial and a personal perspective, they're much better off there than getting a slightly bigger payout and being out of work. Um, so I'd absolutely endorse those comments. Just keep managing that relationship on the way through. Apologies, if they're genuine and timely, I think can be quite effective. I agree with Luke, I don't think they um, create any legal issues for the employer. I think an insincere apology that comes too late and is perceived as insincere will have the opposite impact. Um, sort of something that comes way down the track after an enormous amount of bitterness and angst. Yeah. But a timely apology can certainly help. And, and most people are genuinely sorry that someone has sustained an injury. No one wants to see someone else injured. No, they're very valid points. Can I, can I just make one yeah, further comment? The, the point that Terry made about the um, not making decisions based around how it impacts the common law claim is something that uh, uh, I say to all of my clients that when they leave our office door they've got to forget they've ever met us and they've got to get on with their life without thinking about how that impacts the claim. So uh, if you adopt, if both parties were to adopt that approach and there was an ongoing communication and relationship uh, the outcomes would be um, significantly reduced. We're never going to get rid of all of the claims by any stretch of the imagination, but it uh, it could have a very positive effect. Yeah, that's that's a good point, Luke. I guess we're so fixated, especially, I guess, from work covers um, point of view about employers and how they can wear both hats. But I guess, you, as you rightly pointed out, a worker needs to wear both hats as well. Okay, look, we've got to draw a line in the sand there. A big thank you to Terry and Luke today for being our guest speakers. We do appreciate your time and your valuable insights and knowledge on today's topic. Um, and to our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Um, as we've mentioned earlier, this session's recorded, so we'll send you out a link and be sure to play it back and um, um, uh, write all those lessons that we've learned down today, especially um, the main point that I've um, taken away from today is working or employers working on making um, health and safety an integral part of their business and also um, to keep those relationship and dialogues happening with an injured worker when a common law claim or not even a common law claim just post a, post a workplace injury that uh, maintaining that relationship is so important. Okay, thanks from all of us here today at WorkCover. Um, we look forward to announcing the details of our webinar series in 2022, um, hopefully later this year or early next year. So thank you and have a great day.